Uh, okay, hello. Uh, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, installment uh, of the ICTS uh, virtual string seminar series. Uh, today we are delighted to have uh, Tom Hartman from us, uh, to, uh, with us uh, from uh, Cornell University. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, holographic duality for average free CFTs. Uh, over to you, Tom. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to tell you about a recent paper with Nima F. Kamijeti, Henry Cohn, and Amir Tajini. Um, and this paper came out uh, about a month ago. There was a parallel work by uh, Maloney and Witten that explores some similar ideas that I'll mention as well. So let me set the stage a little bit. The partition function of a two-dimensional conformal field theory uh, is um, a sum over primaries of the characters. And um, how we organize that partition function depends on the algebra, on the Chara algebra, on the symmetries of the theory. Uh, usually, uh, well, often what we talk about are CFTs with Virasoro symmetry, um, just Virasoro symmetry. In that case, uh, we can organize into Virasoro descendants, and the character has uh, one eta function in the denominator here, which is counting the Virasoro descendants of a given primary. Uh, but mostly what I'll focus on in this talk is theories uh, with a U1, with a large number of U1 uh, factors. So um, it's theories with U1 to the C current algebra, where C is the central charge. So um, that basically means that you can account for all of the, you can account for everything uh, just by counting the U1s. So um, in this case, the character has a factor of a to the c in the denominator, and we can organize the partition function uh, this way under u1 to the c. I'm, I'm loosely refer to these theories as free CFTs because we can use the Sugawara construction to uh, write the stress tensor of the u1 factors, and then we're basically left with nothing else. There could be some extra topological stuff, uh, but um, basically these are free. So the partition function is, of course, invariant under uh, the SL2Z transformations, which are transformations of the torus. The starting point for this work was, uh, was the modular bootstrap. So the modular bootstrap is a version of conformal bootstrap, where the idea is to study general consistency conditions of the partition function, that is things like the modular transformations under SL2Z, uh, as well as other properties of the partition function uh, to constrain the space of conformal field theories in two dimensions. There are various questions that you can ask with the modular bootstrap. Um, a sort of prototypical example, and the one that we'll start with, although not really where we'll, not really the direction that we're gonna go ultimately, but the question that I wanna start with is the one that's given here. Uh, is given the central charge, really given the central charge and the Chira algebra. So you could say just given the symmetries of the theory, uh, what is the largest possible gap to the first primary state? That is, uh, what is the scaling dimension delta one of the first primary above the vacuum? Uh, so that's the question that I'm gonna start with. Before I dive into it, let me give a couple of motivations. Uh, the first one is 3D gravity. So uh, the modular bootstrap gives us a way of answering general questions without specializing to a particular theory, asking general questions about the landscape of three-dimensional quantum gravity uh, through ADS-CFT. So we um, can't answer any of the questions that I've written here, uh, but maybe uh, with enough work, we'll be able to answer questions like, does 3D gravity require extra dimensions, uh, strings? Is there such thing as pure gravity and how are we to interpret it? Uh, there's been a lot of work over the last year or two on understanding ensemble averaging and its role in holographic duality. And that's something that we could hope to learn something about from modular bootstrap. For these purposes, the regime that we're interested in is the regime of large central charge uh, large central charge because the central charge is the ratio of the ADS radius to the Planck scale. So for a semi-classic limit, we need large C. And secondly, um, 
we're probably interested in the regime of large scaling dimension because uh, if we're going to, well, I think a lot of these questions about the landscape or the swampland uh, really require black hole physics as an input and black holes are states with large dimension. The second motivation is that we're going to find some interesting connections to math uh, and connecting the bootstrap to um, math. So um, in this talk, we'll study partition functions of CFTs with uh, u1 to the c by u1 to the c current algebra. I first want to briefly review um, some work last year with Dalamil Mazak and Leonardo Ristelli. So uh, in that work, uh, we studied theories with this U1 current algebra, but uh, we studied them at zero angular potential. So we studied the partition function ignoring spin. That is, you set tau bar to minus tau, that sets the angular potential to zero, and then you study constraints on the spinless partition function. What we found is that uh, this, the modular bootstrap for the U1 to the C algebra, ignoring spin, is exactly identical um, to something that mathematicians discovered about uh, 20 years ago now, uh, known as the Cohen-Elke's bounds on sphere packing. So the sphere packing problem is the problem of uh, constraining the density of, of spheres in n dimensions. So here's a picture of a dense sphere packing in two dimensions. This problem becomes incredibly difficult and interesting uh, in various dimensions, and it has only been solved in some in in a few cases. Uh, but in general, um, well, in in most cases, the best known bounds on the sphere packing density come from this Cohen Elkies procedure. So the so what Cohen and Elkies did is they uh, derived a theorem where they used linear programming methods to place constraints on sphere packing. And what we found is that the uh, numerical approach, the, the, the people that, the numerical approach that people have used in modular bootstrap is also based on linear programming. And actually these two methods under the U1 to the C current algebra are exactly equivalent to each other. The equivalence is uh, basically what's written here, that delta one of, at a given central charge, delta one, the, the first dimension delta one raised to the power C uh, is proportional to the sphere packing density in N equals two C dimensions. So if you put a lower bound on delta one, then you've also put, um, or sorry, if you put an upper bound on delta one, then you've also put an upper bound on the sphere packing density. So I want to sort of summarize where things stand in terms of constraints on the first scaling dimension. And I have both Virasoro and U1 on this slide. So let me sort of unpack this uh, slowly and explain what's showing up here. And please jump in if you have uh, questions. So um, on the left is for the Virasoro algebra. Uh, the, what I'm plotting here is the, is the spectrum going up. So at delta equals C over 12, uh, and, this, and this slide is going to be at large central charge, large C, because this is a limit relevant to gravity. So um, on the left, we have Virasoro. From 3D gravity, we expect lots of states to appear at the black hole threshold, because the black hole entropy is large. The black hole threshold is at C over 12. And um, another, the, the way of understanding C over 12 from the CFT point of view is that this is the point where the Cardi formula kicks in. In other words, uh, if you take the vacuum state in one channel and you, trans and you reinterpret that vacuum state as a sum of states in the other channel uh, under a modular transformation, then uh, the spectrum of the, the, that spectrum of the vacuum translates into a spectrum that starts at C over 12. That's really, it's the threshold for the vacuum state in the dual channel. Up here, are the best known analytic and numerical bounds on delta one. So the statement is that uh, you have to have a state below these, below these bounds. Okay, so that's the situation for Virasoro. Uh, 
uh, part of the motivation of, of studying these bounds on delta one is to ultimately try to push these bounds down to the black hole threshold. Because if we can do that, uh, then we might actually be able to use modular bootstrap to solve pure gravity in three dimensions or to rule it out uh, in sort of a similar way that people have used bootstrap in the Ising model. You start out by deriving constraints, but if you can make the constraints small enough, uh, then you can pin down particular theories. That hasn't happened. Uh, I think um, well, I, we'll see if it's possible in the future, but um, right now the issue is that uh, the spinless modular bootstrap doesn't doesn't seem to be powerful enough, powerful enough to do this. You really need to include spin. Uh, Tom, uh, uh, hi, this is Rajesh. Uh, 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 um, so, it just uh, uh, just remind me, where, if the from the numerical bootstrap, the current bound is something like c over eight point something or nine or something like that was it yeah uh, yeah these these eight. bounds are c over 9.1 and c over 8.5 is the best analytic bound okay i see so and it's the, the nine the 9.1 is probably optimal for the spinless for the spinless bootstrap at large c so i don't think that's not that's probably the best we'll ever do for spinless bootstrap and the analytic bound is from the extremal functionals? Uh, no. Uh, um. The analytic bound um, comes from um, this paper with Dalmiel and Leonardo. And what we did is we used the free fermion functionals that Dalmiel had constructed in earlier work. And so there was some combination of those free fermion functionals, which gave the 8.5. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, Tom, a question about the previous slide. Uh, you yeah. said at some point if a bound in delta one translated into bound and sphere packing density, uh, this one. So what is expected about this at large C? Uh, on this this right right hand side. I mean, what's the asymptotic behavior? Yeah, not much is known about it. Uh, well, for delta one, you mean, or no, for the sphere, uh, for sphere, sphere packing density. density. Very little is known about the large dimensions. There's an enormous. There's a. There's a a lower bound on the best packing density and there's an upper bound on the best packing density in a high number of dimensions and they're exponentially far from each other so really very little is known it's very hard to construct examples oh so you don't even know if it tends to one or if it tends to zero i mean my question uh, is no. not obvious. does it tend to one or no, does it, it tend to zero yeah, it, it definitely goes to zero it, it goes to zero I see. It goes to zero um, just because there's a lot of space in higher dimensions. So, so it goes down. I see. But you don't know how it goes down, like power law, nothing is what you're saying. Um, well, there's a, no, it goes, it goes down exponentially. I see. Uh, well, let's see. It depends if we, okay, if we, if we phrase things in terms of delta one, uh -huh. then, uh, Then, uh, well, okay, no, I can't, I can't translate variables. Um, the, the packing density goes down exponentially. Delta one, um, the best known bounds on delta one are linear in C. So, so it's similar. So that in terms of delta one, the best known bounds are similar to the, the bounds that you would expect from Virasora. They're like, um, well, the, these I was about to mention on this slide. Um, does that answer? I, 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 I okay. don't remember the formulas, but okay, fine, that's fine. That's that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so for you one to the C, um, the there are these best known analytic and numerical bounds, which are actually extremely close to each other, but not quite the same. So this is uh, work in another recent paper of ours with David Delat. Um, the the upper bound in this case is from the 70s, actually. So so there's an upper bound um, that was originally derived from uh, error correcting codes, which has been translated now into a bound on the U1 of the C bootstrap. Uh, the um, numerical bound is recent. But what I wanted actually to highlight on this. Uh, slide was the analog of the black hole threshold for 
um, the U1 to the C problem. So uh, in this case, instead of, so there's no, there's no black holes because there's no, there's no bulk theory yet. Uh, but what I'm showing here is the Cardi threshold. So what I mean is if you take the vacuum state with U1 to the C and you do a modular transform on the vacuum state, then um, you find the first state in the, after doing the modular transformation, you find your first state around C over two pi E. And at large C, the density of states grows exponentially above that. So uh, this is sort of the analog from the point of view of the Cardi formula, this is the analog of the black hole threshold, C over two pi E. And that's gonna be important. Um, that's gonna come back later. But what I'm gonna do now is change gears and include spin. That is, uh, we now want to study the full partition function, z of tau tau bar, for independent uh, complex tau and tau bar. Still talking about free CFT, so CFT is with the u1 to the c by u1 to the c current algebra. Tom? This, yes. Uh, sorry, I have a basic question. So uh, the uh, Cardi, uh, the bound that Cardi formula gives you, by model, uh, modular transforming uh, the identity block uh, and the states for, start from uh, the points that you showed. Now, in a th in an actual theory, in addition to the vacuum block, you would have you could have a, a additional you know other uh, operators. They could be heavy or light, but they, their contribution would be additive to this uh, background, right? So in that sense, yes. why is it that the modular bootstrap? Not, not telling you that the bound should be the Cardi bound. The bound, the um, bound. The, yeah, the, um, you, you mean why can you ever get, why, why can't you just prove that there have to be states at the Cardi bound? Yeah, yeah, just from this, this, this statement that the vacuum block, when modular transformed starts from, you know, there are states there and then and, and the rest of the contribution would be positive. Um, let's see. It's because, um, and I understand it's a kind of a vague question, but just want to understand the, the intuition. Yeah. yeah, there can be cancellations in, in that. I mean, there certainly are cancellations because, um, you know, the Cardi formula gives you a continuum of states above C over 12. So in the, when you, when you do the, the full sum, when you, when you include the full spectrum, that continuum mostly cancels and has to just reduce to a bunch of delta functions. So there's certainly lots of cancellations in the spectrum. Okay. I, I think that part, part, of the, part, part of the reason that intuition is tricky here is that um, the, if, you, if you think of this, tra this transform as the The, the functions here are sort of not quite um, L2. So the, free, the, the transform here is not really um, invertible. So I think that needs to be accounted for in order to understand how those cancellations occur. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so now we're looking at the spinning bootstrap. This does not constrain general sphere packings. Uh, it was motivated originally by the spear packing uh, business because that's why we're looking at U1 to the C, but now we're just going to study this on its own. At small c, sorry, it's, yeah, at small c, uh, we can study this problem numerically and we've derived constraints numerically and found examples um, to understand what, uh, what the bounds are on the first state, delta 1. Uh, but I want to go straight to the problem at large C and ask what can we say about the first state in the limit as C goes to infinity? Well, the numerical bounds don't work. And I'm, so I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm not really going to be studying constraints. Um, what we're going to do instead is we're going to look for examples. And um, we can construct free CFTs by compactifying C bosons uh, on a torus in C dimension. So this is the uh, Narain construction of toroidal CFTs familiar from string theory. The partition function of a Narain CFT 
is written here. So um, the conformal dimensions p squared and p bar squared um, are obtained from points p and p bar that live in a lattice with special properties. So that lattice is called a Narain lattice. It's a uh, lattice with split signature in two C dimensions, and it's even and self-dual. The statement that the lattice is even is the requirement that spins are integer, and self-dual is, uh, mo is modular invariance. So uh, we can construct these examples of free CFTs from Narain lattices. Just to orient ourselves, uh, the example of a single compact boson is written here. There you have momentum and winding numbers M and N, um, and you have a radius R for the, um, a target radius R, and the points on the lattice are just the sum and difference of the momentum and winding. Now, we don't know in general how to find the Narain lattice with the maximal gap. Uh, so what we did instead is to look at an average Narain lattice. And this is actually a fairly standard trick uh, that mathematicians use to understand, um, well, to constrain the shortest vector of a lattice. We're gonna apply this to CFT. So we're gonna compute delta one for an average Narain lattice. What do we mean by an average Narain lattice? So um, the moduli space of Narain CFTs um, is actually fairly simple because up to um, up to the action of the orthogonal group, there's actually only one Narain lattice uh, in any given number of dimensions. So given a Narain lattice, we can find all the other Narain lattices by acting on it with OC comma C. Not all of those are inequivalent, some of those are equivalent. Um, so uh, we have to divide by the OC and OC acting individually because those CFTs uh, are equivalent to each other. Um, and we also have to mod out by the t-duality group, which are the discrete transformations that leave the original lattice unchanged. So for example, uh, in the compact boson, um, the, the t-duality is r to one over r, um, and so the moduli space, uh, so we have to divide out by that t-duality, and the moduli space of the compact boson is just r greater than one. For C greater than two, uh, so the, the case of C is one and two are sort of tricky, but for C greater than two, uh, this space, this moduli space that we've written down actually has finite volume under the Haar measure for OCC. What that means is that we can integrate over moduli space and define an average, and this averaging is well-defined. There's already a natural metric on the moduli space of a CFT, which is this Emelogikov metric. Uh, in the case of Narain CFTs, these two measures, uh, well, these two measures agree with each other. So the Zemelogikov metric and the Haar measure on OCC are the same. Uh, so um, in order to calculate the average partition function, uh, what we wanna do is we wanna take the partition function of the, of the Narain CFT and integrate it over the moduli um, with the Haar measure and then divide by the volume of moduli space. This will give us an average partition function. Um, and actually the statement is that the moduli space has finite volume for C greater than, equal, greater than or equal to two, uh, but this, the partition function, this integral that defines the average partition function only, only converges for C strictly greater than two. So that's what the, we're gonna to stick to C greater than two. This integral uh, was actually evaluated uh, 70 years ago by Siegel in 1951. So uh, in CFT, so Siegel of course was not phrasing things this way. He was thinking about lattices and not about CFTs. Uh, but we can take his results and translate them into the language of CFT. So in CFT language, uh, what Siegel derived is an average density of states for CFTs, uh, which I've written here. So let me explain the notation here. 
uh, rho L of delta is the density of states at spin L uh, as a function of delta. So L is, is a discrete label, delta is a continuous label. Um, a couple things to note about it. First of all, the, this density of states that we're finding is continuous. Uh, it's, it's a continuous function of delta, unlike an individual element of the ensemble where the spectrum would be discrete. And um, secondly, it extends all the way down to the unitarity bound, uh, delta equals the absolute value of L. So uh, the spectrum basically goes as low as it goes to zero, as it goes, as, goes, as, goes to the unitarity bound as low as it can go, um, and then is continuous up to infinity. So this is a fairly <laughs> complex, the, this row includes the uh, includes the states that are created by the uh, by the currents, the U1 currents. Uh, this this row is for primaries only. I see. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the density of primaries, and we have to multiply this by the U1 characters to get the full density of state. Uh, so it's a fairly complicated looking function that comes out. The sigma here is the is the divisor function. So there's some number theory hiding in here. Um, um, but this is the answer that comes out of Siegel's averaging calculation. Oh, can I ask a question here? Yeah. Uh, so how does the uh, typical density of states compare with the average density of states? I mean, how much, uh, you, you said it's discrete, but what's the level spacing and how much do you have to smooth it out to get the average? Um, let's see. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that, I, th I think that those are questions that one can answer with, with information about the, the, the expectation value of multiple Z's, like the, the, the ZZ, the ZZ two point, um, average, um, not much is known about that. Maloney and Witten calculated in some limit, but I don't have anything useful to say about it. So I want to sketch. Uh, yeah, hi, Tom. Yeah. Uh, just um, this um, this formula uh, is uh, the fact that C is an integer uh, uh, appearing only in that divisor function. Uh, Well, the divisor function actually, this, this doesn't care. Uh, this ca the divisor function cares that L is an integer, but doesn't, it doesn't care that C is an integer. Um, so this yeah. is an analytic formula in C. I mean, this can be analytically continued to C equals Yes, D. that's right. Yeah, it's analytic in C. OK. Right, so C equal to 2 in particular makes sense, even though maybe the original integral didn't R. Well, it's equals two. It's equals two. There, um, so something funny happens here with C equals two that um, gives some. I believe C. I believe C equals two is is a um, singular point. So I don't. I don't think this can really be defined at C equals two without some kind of regularization procedure. Uh, but at, at generic values of comp of of C, you can continue. So, uh, so this is the uh, so when you do the calculation, you don't really use the fact that C is an integer, like the in the original integral. Is it that thing? I mean, I'm just trying to see where the fact that C is an integer really appears. The measure and so on is probably analytic in C. Um, I'm about to sketch the derivation, so we'll we'll see the C. Um, okay, so um, I want to give some sense of how this der how the Siegel's derivation works. This isn't quite the way Siegel said it. I've um, I'm going to ref. It's the same. It's it's the same basic logic, and this is known to the number theorists certainly. But I'm going to rephrase things in terms of the modular bootstrap language. Uh, I want to give a warm up calculation first 
uh, because this has the main logic in it already, and I think it's a really beautiful proof of a simple statement. Okay, so uh, Ziegel actually started not with the rain lattices, but with Euclidean lattices of determinant one, and so we're going to start there. The moduli space of Euclidean lattices uh, of determinant one is just SLDR in, in D dimension. So we can just act with SLDR. We can just start with the square lattice and act with the SLDR to get all the others. And we have to mod out by the integer transformations that leave the lattice invariant. So uh, what Ziegel proved is that the average density of lattice vectors uh, for these Euclidean lattices is, um, is uniform. It's just one up to a delta function because every, uh, every um, well, by definition, every Euclidean um, lattice has a point at the origin. So we, we fix a point at the origin and then, and then um, transform these lattices. Uh, but the um, point being uh, really this one here, uh, that if, so if you, if, you pick a, if you pick a small volume in Euclidean space, and then you average over lattices and ask, what's the probability that I found something in that volume, the answer will just be uh, proportional to the volume. This seems sort of clear. I mean, I guess if you had to guess, this is probably what you would guess. Uh, but the proof is really nice. So here's how you prove it. Um, so Euclidean space has only two orbits under SLDR. It has uh, the origin. The origin is, is fixed under SLDR and it has everything else. So SLDR can take you from any non-zero point to any other non-zero point. Well, the um, measure on random lattices has to respect the SLDR symmetry. And um, that means we just have to have the homogeneous measure on each orbit. So the requirement of SLDR symmetry uh, fixes the answer up to two coefficients. The only uh, measure we can put on the origin is a delta function. So that's one term. And the only homogeneous measure we can put everywhere else uh, is a constant, just the usual measure. Um, so we just, the, the final answer has to be a sum of these and we just have to fix the coefficients. To fix the coefficients, we use the asymptotics. Well, to fix a one, to, to fix the to fix the coefficient of the of the delta function, this is just obviously one because every lattice has one has exactly one point at the origin, so that's easy. Uh, to fix a two, we use the asymptotics. The density of points um, has to go to one at uh, the density has to go to one at at large distances um, because in a lattice of determinant one. Uh, you have to have at least on very large, if you have a lattice of determinant one, imagine going to very large scales, uh, then the, the sort of unit cell uh, is the determinant, just one. So you know that on very large scales, you're going to um, see on average one point per unit volume. Uh, and that asymptotics fixes A2 to be equal to one. And uh, that's the proof. So you're, you're done. You, do, you use symmetries to fix uh, each orbit under the symmetry, and then use the asymptotics to fix the coefficients of the orbits. Now I'm going to repeat this for Narain lattices following Siegel. So, um, it, for so the Narain lattice has these points in R C comma C, this split signature space. In terms of the CFT data, uh, the scaling dimension is uh, the sum. So the scaling dimension is the norm as computed by the usual Euclidean norm. And the spin is the norm uh, using the split signature uh, metric. So OCC, uh, which is now, now we're averaging over OCC. The OCC uh, symmetry preserves the spin because the spin uh, is calculated using the OCC invariant metric. So it preserves the spin. Um, and therefore, uh, in the Narain lattice problem, instead of having just two orbits of the symmetry, like we had in the Euclidean problem, there we just had the origin and everything else. 
In the Narain case, we have an infinite set of orbits labeled by spin. On each orbit, the uh, measure on that orbit has to be the homogeneous measure uh, induced by OCC symmetry. So in so, uh, the, the easy way for a physicist to, to calculate this is just to write down the line element on, the herp on this hyperboloid defined by x squared minus y squared equals 2L and uh, just read off the volume element on that hyperboloid. That gives this factor of uh, delta squared minus L squared to the C over two minus one. Notice that this is the factor, this is, so the, the final answer, Siegel's final answer is proportional to this factor. Uh, so the point is that that part of the calculation is purely fixed by the OCC symmetry. So the hard part of the calculation is finding the coefficient uh, as a function, finding the coefficient as a function of L so that you can sum all these up together and get the correct average on the rain lattices. Okay, so far so good, questions? We just use, so far we just use symmetries to fix it up to a coefficient. Now we're gonna do the same thing we did in the Euclidean case and use the asymptotics to fix the coefficients. We need to fix an infinite number of coefficients using the asymptotics. For this, we use the Hardy-Littlewood circle method, which is like a fancy version of the Cardi formula. Uh, it's a fancier version of the Cardi formula because it can, it can do individual spins. Okay, so the, the usual Cardi formula uh, is not labeled by spin, it's just the total density of states. The Hardy-Littlewood method gives you a way of, of calculating this for individual spins. Uh, so I'm just gonna sketch this briefly. So the uh, partition function is um, a sum of primaries, uh, these rho L of deltas are the density of states, and then there's a weighting. Um, and we can invert this formula to formally write the density of states uh, by doing an inverse Fourier transform that's here. And then uh, that, so that picks out a particular spin and then doing an inverse Laplace transform that uh, turns this uh, from a function of temperature into a function of scaling dimension. So formally, we'd like to do this integral. Now, as, as you take beta to zero, which is the high temperature limit, this integral uh, is dominated near the cusps of SL2z. In the usual derivation of the Cardi formula, you only have to you only have to include one cusp, which is the tau, the thing you get from taking tau to minus one over tau. For this more general problem, uh, you have to actually include the contributions of, in, of an infinite number of cusps of SL2z, which are all the all the rational numbers. So, uh, all the rational numbers on the real line are cusps of SL2z, and all of them. Uh, contribute to this integral, but um, all of them in, in near all these points, the partition function can be evaluated using modular invariance. Uh, so the basic strategy is to use modular invariance to evaluate z near all these cusps, and then sum over rational numbers, that is over co-prime a and b. So that can be done very explicitly. And I won't go through the algebra, but the uh, result is what I wrote before. It's Ziegel's uh, measure, uh, it's Ziegel's measure, the, the average density of states in an array CFT. So the function here was fixed by symmetries and the coefficient was fixed by modular invariance. Now, um, Let's talk about delta one, because I originally motivated looking at this problem uh, by thinking about the spectral gap, that is thinking about the gap to the first primary in the spectrum. Um, well, it looks a bit like the, it, so it, it looks like the density of states goes all the way down to zero, and it does, uh, but um, what I really mean by delta one here is we wanna add the, the in an actual theory, the density of states is, is a bunch of integers. Um, so um, 
there's a window near the origin here of some very small delta where there's less than one state. If there's less than one state, that means most Noranian CFTs have no states in that region. Um, so what I mean by the gap in the average sense is we just take the density of states and set it to one. So we ask, where does the integrated density of states, uh, which gives the same answer, where does that add up to one? And the answer there at large C is C over two pi E. Now, okay, so, so C over two pi E is the gap, is the, is the effectively the gap of the average Narain CFT at large C. Below that, we have less than one state. Now this um, was, this, so we did this calculation just wanting to understand whether we could place bounds on delta one, but uh, the answer agrees with the Cardi formula. And that led, that I think um, to anyone who, is, who has worked on 3D gravity is gonna ring some bells uh, because it's been a longstanding problem in ordinary 3D gravity with Brosaurus symmetry. It's been a longstanding problem um, to try to construct simple theories, uh, simple CFTs, with, which have a large gap. And in particular, which have a gap that agrees with the Cardi gap, and therefore with the black hole gap in ABS3. This is a case uh, which is a little different because we're doing U1, but it's got a similar kind of flavor to it that uh, you, we now have this, this CFT, the average Narain CFT, whose gap agrees with the Cardi formula. And that sort of uh, sounds a little bit like holography. So now the question uh, that this raises is what does this have to do with 3D gravity? So to explain this, I need to go back to an earlier Maloney-Witten paper from 2007. So uh, in this paper in 2007, Maloney and Witten proposed a way of calculating the partition function of pure gravity. Uh, they, what they did is they, they took all of the known saddle points of gravity in three dimensions and calculated the action and the um, perturbative corrections around those saddles and then added them up. This was a proposal to evaluate the, the path integral of 3D gravity. Um, what that calculation gives is it gives a sum over BTZ black holes of um, the Virasoro vacuum character. So you take the Virasoro vacuum character uh, and then you sum it over black holes, which turns into a sum over SL2Z because the black holes are labeled by elements of SL2Z. So you end up with this sum over modular images which is known to mathematicians as a Poincaré series. And the proposal of Maloney and Witten is that this Poincaré series calculates the partition function of pure gravity in three dimensions. The status of this, uh, so this, this was a while ago, the status of this is, is unresolved. So they, uh, they, what they found when they did this sum is that the answer didn't make sense as a conformal field theory. There were there, was, there were two problems with it. Uh, one was that it was giving a continuous spectrum, and that seems strange. Now, that's not necessarily a deal breaker. Maybe, maybe it's a theory with a continuous spectrum, uh, but it seems strange. It's not what we normally expect in ADS CFT. Uh, and secondly, there were, uh, it was non unitary. So that's a more serious problem. There were negative terms uh, in, the, in, the, in the sum. And um, there's been a lot of follow-up work over the years in, in trying to understand the, the continuum and trying to get rid of the non-unitarity. Uh, non uh, but I think this is still unresolved and it's not really clear how to think about uh, this putative dual of 3D gravity or how to do this calculation. Now, there's another element of this story, which is recent, which is the much better understanding we have now of pure gravity in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, pure gravity is, is or what we might call pure gravity is, is JT gravity. And it was shown by Saad Schenker and Stanford that JT gravity uh, does have a holographic duality, but it's a, um, 
it's a different sort of holographic duality because JT is dual to a random matrix theory. It's not dual to an individual quantum mechanics like you might expect from ordinary A to CFT. It's dual to random matrix theory. Uh, so there's some averaging involved there. It's the inclusion of higher topologies in JT gravity that uh, is that forces you to consider theories with averaging. So uh, a question which is still open is whether 3D gravity also uh, corresponds to an ensemble averaging. There was a recent paper by Maxfield and Teriachi, which uh, and also a paper by um, Kotler and Jensen, these papers have given some pretty good evidence that ensemble averaging does play some role, um, but the full story is so far uh, not understood. S from a CFT point of view, uh, this issue of trying to ensemble average in two dimensions sounds really mysterious. CFTs dual to pure gravity are isolated in the space of CFTs, so it's hard to imagine how you would average over them. Uh, they have no, they have no exactly marginal operators. So uh, you just have a bunch of points sitting there in, the, in a discrete, a bunch of discrete points. Um, we don't know how to find those points and we don't know what measure we would put on them if we did find them. So uh, the idea of trying to define a, an average over, over Virasoro type holographic dual CFTs uh, sounds really quite difficult, but uh, what I want to argue uh, is that um, we can get a toy version of this and a very uh, a simple version of an average holographic duality just by replacing Virasoro with U1 to the C and repeating this analysis of Maloney and Whitten from 2007. So we're going to replace Virasoro by U1 to the C and try again. Oh, sorry, Tom, could you say in like 30 seconds, what is the nature of the evidence that you mentioned that averaging is playing some role for Virasoro theorems? Um, yeah, it comes from looking, um, it comes from looking at the double torus. So they, so Kotler and Jensen calculated this double torus um, in 3D gravity. If the if the if there was no averaging, the answer should be just it should just factorize, but it didn't factorize. It gave something that, at least in some limits, looked sort of similar to a to a random matrix theory. So, so they computed a sort of wormhole contribution to this. To this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I want to state the conjecture. Uh, the conjecture is that the theory, uh, so the conjecture that we made is that the theory of an average Narain lattice is holographically dual uh, to a theory in three dimensions, which is not quite, it's not ordinary gravity. You know, this is a theory with U1 to the C symmetry. It's obviously not ordinary gravity. Uh, we give it the name U1 gravity uh, because it has so many U1s. It's a theory that's similar to U1 to the C by U1 to the C Chern Simons theory, although it's not quite Chern Simons theory. And I will um, make some more comments on that in a minute. But let me give the evidence for this. Well, first of all, this was uh, motivated by this observation about the, about the C over two pi E. So it was motivated by this observation about the first state but we can get much stronger evidence by repeating the Maloney-Witten calculation from 2007. The uh, action of U1 to the C by U1 to the C churn simons theory is just two copies, um, is just um, two churn simons sorry, C's churn simons with a positive level and C churn simons with a negative level. And the definition of this theory is that uh, we take uh, this churn simons and sum over three manifold topologies. Exactly, we didn't define exactly how to do this sum or how to do it on higher genus surfaces, uh, but in this parallel, parallel paper of Maloney and Witten, they did understand how to do this at higher genus. I'll mention the result that they found. So this theory is the one that we consider because it has the perturbative excitations of the U1 current algebra. That is, if you take this bulk theory and you calculate the one loop partition function, uh, say on thermal ADS, then the, 
uh, one loop partition function of this theory is exactly the vacuum character for u1 to the c by u1 to the c. So that was the reason for picking this bulk theory. Um, but now that we have that theory, we're going to sum over topologies. And so what we um, propose for the full partition function on the torus uh, is a Poincaré sum over three-dimensional handle bodies. So you take, uh, you take this one loop answer, which is the U1 vacuum character, and then you sum it over SL2Z. There's some, you have to actually mod out because some of these terms are equivalent, but it's just a technicality. Um, so you want to do this sum. Uh, sorry, John, why was there a minus between those two, two U1? That a parity or? Uh, parity, yeah, it's right in the left, yeah. Thank you. So this sum is a sum that you can do. It actually has a name. Uh, this sum turns out to be proportional to a non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. Uh, you can do the sum, and the result of that sum can, um, is some partition function. And then you can reinterpret, you can ask, what is the spectrum of, the, of this theory after doing the sum? So you do the sum, you find a partition function, and then you read off it, its corresponding density of states. The answer is exactly the Siegel measure on random terrain lattices. So it's exactly this uh, function that I wrote up earlier with the divisor function and the delta squared minus L squared to a power. Uh, that is the density of states that you get by doing this Poincaré sum. This is, Tom, this is true for finite C? Yes, for any C greater than two. Uh, so this is exact at any C greater than two. Um, okay, so this was, um, of course, a surprise, but um, also, of course, the mathematicians already knew this. In fact, Siegel already knew this. Uh, this, is, this is a version of what's known as the siegel weil formula in the math literature, um, which in general is a relationship between um, Eisenstein series uh, like we had on the bulk side and what they call integrated theta, average theta functions, what we would call an average partition function uh, for these Narain CFTs. So this is a, this is general mathematical uh, relationship, which actually generalizes. What, the, what yeah. is a handle body? A uh, handle body, um, so we're summing over, uh, we're summing over the torus and all the ways of filling in the torus. Those are the handle bodies. Those are like uh, solid donuts. But there are other three-dimensional there are other three-dimensional topologies which are not solid tori, and uh, our prescription is just not to include them. It's not obvious that that's the right thing to do, um, or why that would be the right thing to do in the bulk theory. It's just a prescription that we put in by hand. If I understand right, you're just summing over the usual things, the things that are the modular transforms of the vacuum. That's right. That's right. So it's the same sum that was done by Maloney and Witten. I think that some of this recent work on, on JT gravity suggests that we should include maybe more general topologies in, the, in 3D gravity, um, but it doesn't seem to be necessary here in this U1 gravity. Thank you. Okay, a few comments about this theory. Uh, first of all, this is not gravity. Um, you know, it's this other Chern-Simons-like theory uh, but it does have a Virasoro subalgebra, uh, so it does have a sort of graviton. It has a composite graviton uh, that's built out of using the Sirguar construction that's built out of the U1 currents. So it is sort of like a theory of gravity. Secondly, this is not Chern Simon's theory. Um, the perturbative excitations on the torus are identical to this Chern Simon's theory that I wrote down, uh, but um, there isn't a fully non-perturbative way of understanding this as a Chern-Simons theory. So for comparison, ordinary 3D gravity is related to an SL2R times SL2R Chern-Simons theory, but they're not identical. So um, although we don't have a non-perturbative definition of this bulk theory, uh, the working hypothesis is that there's some kind of theory that's related to Chern-Simons theory in a similar way to how 3D gravity is related to Chern-Simons theory. It's just a different Chern-Simons theory. 
The third comment uh, is that this is sort of similar to a higher spin duality uh, in that not only is there a composite graviton, there are also composite higher spin currents. So um, it, has, it has sort of higher spin-like flavor to it. Uh, and there are other discussions, um, uh, for example, all this literature coming after um, um, Guppa Kumar and, and Gabardil's uh, proposal for higher spin holography in, in ADS-3. Uh, there are all sorts of constructions of, of um, higher spin theories in a turn simons like language. So that might be a useful way to think about this as well, although it seems to be different from the higher spin dualities that were discussed before. Uh, so Maloney and Witten, in their paper that came out the same day, uh, they also, so they studied the same proposal uh, for, for this duality between average and rain lattices and a turn simons like theory in the bulk. They also confirmed it at higher genus. So for example, uh, they calculated the sum over topologies of this double torus and um, related, so, um, the, the bulk calculation is this sum over topologies. What this is supposed to calculate is the average of the product of partition functions uh, averaged in the, over, the, over the car measure. Uh, and they confirm that using the Siegel, so one, once, you, once you've um, put this into the formalism of siegel Vey, you can borrow results from siegel Vey, and um, it's actually much more general than just the torus. And so they were able to use that to derive uh, various matchings at higher genus, including this double torus. So uh, what we're seeing here is the same thing. It was very similar to what happened in JT gravity, where Euclidean wormholes uh, in the bulk side are giving you uh, a, are related to ensemble averaging on the boundary. Because uh, if, you know, in individual CFT, of course, quantities like this uh, would have to just factorize and um, we couldn't have any contribution to them from the bulk. Or if we did have a contribution, it would have to uh, somehow cancel and add up to zero. Here, it does not add up to zero, but uh, it's um, interpreted as the fact that it's not dual to an individual theory, it's dual to an average. Tom, one question. Yeah. So when you write some more topologies here, uh, what are the topologies they are summing over? For the torus, it was kind of easy to specify, but for this uh, funny thing, uh, uh, what are the special ones that are to be? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. I mean, not all of the, I, I don't think I can give a detailed answer. Um, it's roughly the, So basically, you you take you you start with one one of these double torus type geometries like the vacuum one, uh, and then you sum over modular images of that. Now, not every one of those modular images even has a description as a three manifold. So calling this a sum over topologies is a bit of a cheat. Um, it's really a it's a sum over modular images of this of a there's a vacuum character that you sum over modular images in a particular way. But um, I don't think I can reproduce the formula. Okay, thank you. On the spot. Sorry, but, but, but just, just to continue on that, there would have been other natural three manifolds to, that could have included that go beyond what you just said or not? So you were cutting I mean, out, say it again. Uh, would there have been other natural, I, I want to understand uh, along the line of Abhijit's question, whether this is a prescription that cuts down manifolds, like would there have been other natural three manifolds that could have filled up two torus thing, other than the ones they considered? Or, uh, um, I mean, was yeah. this a prescription or was it some of the natural? There are other manifolds that, there are certainly other topologies that one could write down. Um, you know, even in the, um, well, similar to the, Similar to the issue on Taurus, there were non handle bodies that, that could have been written down um, and were not included. There's a similar situation here. There's lots of things that are not being included. 
Thanks. Can I ask a question, Tom? So yep. it's when you don't include everything that is necessary to be included that you may arrive at some sort of an ensemble average picture. Is that, I mean, usually in ordinary physics, one can imagine something like that. But if you, yes, that's right. So yeah, you might think, you know, one, so the answer you're getting here is not factorizing. Um, yes. I think you, you might wonder if you could include more terms and get it to factorize. Um, I think that's what's supposed to happen in, in holographic dualities that, that are in, in cases where it's dual to an individual theory. Uh, but I don't think we know how to do that in any detail. And in this example, um, it's the same. We, we also don't know how to do it in this example. We don't know any way of, of including other contributions and getting it to factorize, but I can't rule out that possibility. Okay, thanks. So I was um, basically done. So let me conclude here. Um, first of all, I uh, reviewed the fact that in studying theories with this large symmetry, if we ignore spin, then we make this connection to sphere packing. Uh, and we've used that to understand some new properties of sphere, of sphere packing, especially in a large number of dimensions, although I, I didn't go into that in much detail. Um, and secondly, if we really look at the CFTs as full-blown CFTs, uh, as we did um, when we studied the partition functions with spin, uh, then we find some indication of averaging in ADS3 CFT2 from the sum over topologies. And this toy model for an averaged holographic duality uh, relating a turn simons like theory in the bulk to uh, an integration over moduli space of Narain CFTs on the boundary. And I'll end there. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Tom, for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we could all probably unmute ourselves and clap for Tom. <laughs> and uh, we can have more questions now. Uh, hi, uh, Tom. Um, uh, so um, uh, two questions, uh, one slightly vague and one a little more concrete. Uh, the, the concrete one is about the average density of states. Uh, once you sum over L, uh, the, the sum of the spins, is this a monotonically increasing function, uh, at least in the up to the threshold or something? Uh, um, so you're you're asking about this function? Um, yeah, the the row that, that the, function there. Yeah, once you sum over L uh, for a fixed delta. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, these are all mono, each, each term is monotonically increasing. So the sum is also monotonically increasing. Okay. Mm. Okay, so uh, if one, uh, so you're, you're saying that uh, the, uh, the weights because each of these delta square minus L, these give you something monotonically increasing. And the weights are such that, uh, yeah, they would, uh, uh, they're all positive weights and so they. Right. Uh, okay. Um, uh, the second question is about uh, this, um, this relation to uh, maybe some kind of a higher spin uh, theory, supposing C was like uh, order n square, you would think this is some abelianization of uh, an SLNR Chern Simons theory. Uh, but if you just naively were to abelianize, I think that's sort of, uh, I, I mean, it, it's like replacing a, like a UN Yang Mills theory with a U1 to the n square Yang Mills theory. You, you don't cut, you, you don't you're not uh, cutting down enough uh, states, uh, I guess. Uh, you, is there some way to, uh, is there some uh, signature of that maybe uh, that, uh, that you, one can see that the, this, this is sort of going some way to 
to uh, to uh, reduce the gauge degrees of freedom, but the non-abelian gauge degrees of freedom, I mean, the non-abelian Gauss law constraints in some sense uh, uh, are not, uh, not there. It's a little vague, but uh, is there's- Yeah, I can say one thing which is sort of in this direction, which is that this theory does not have phase transitions in the canonical ensemble at order at, at temperatures with no at order one temperatures with no with no season. Mm. Uh, so um, all of these different SL two images SL two Z images are contributing, and they 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 sort of all contribute at all values of the temperature. Um, so you don't get transitions between them like you would expect uh, in a, in a more in the usual non abelian duality. I see. Hmm. Now that that was also something that happened, in, I think, in the higher in the in the vector higher spin dualities. So maybe for similar reasons. Mm -hmm. Just following up on this, I mean, in normal examples of ADS CFT, as you take C to infinity, the spectrum of fields in the bulk stays fixed. Um, here, as you take C to infinity, you're adding fields in the bulk. It's, it's yeah. in some sense, yeah. some sense not very holographic. Agreed. Although, although the number of primaries, you're not adding primaries. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit of both, right? It's the, the first primary is growing with C, but you're right that you're adding all these currents. So that way it looks different. Right. And you also see that from the density of states, right? The density of states, even at very low energies, has a C. And there's no, uh, nothing like a single trace part. This density of states? This delta squared minus L squared. Um, well, that, no, I would say we don't see it here because this is the density of primaries. And if you set, so this really starts at delta greater than C over two pi E. I mean, it does, there's a tiny tail below C over two pi E, but, it's, but the density of states there is exponentially small. So I don't know if we should count it. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's less than one. Exactly how to think about that, I'm not sure, but it's, it's, not that there are, it's not that there are many light states. It's really that most, most CFTs in the ensemble have no light primaries. Thank you. So you're saying these are sort of like the black holes. They're the non-perturbative yeah. states. Yeah. Uh, but the black hole spectrum is weird. It's so weird that you don't have it. Right, right. Thank you. So, so sorry, uh, you said uh, uh, there's no phase transition, but. Uh, uh, so that's uh, so the in in some ways it's like the, because the the density of states there's this big gap it's uh, it's always like the the black hole states are sort of dominating the spectrum uh, or something is that uh, what you want to say that it's uh, uh, um. I mean there's no gas of gravitons uh, which is uh, dominating at any temperature. Mm. It, isn't the gas of graviton also giving you a contribution in this case like C, unlike in the usual case? If you, it depends if you talk about the density of primaries or the density of all states. So if you talk about the density of all states, then yes, it's giving a C. The vacuum character itself has a C. From the- It has a, has, has a growth. Right. From the, right, right. From the yeah, which That's are right. I guess the boundary gravitons. So that tells you that there's no clear reason there should be a phase transfer. Not like the one was one and the other was. Yeah, I don't think it's well. I don't think it's that it's always dominated by the black holes. Like I think if I write down the the vacuum character and it's and it's and it's s dual, and I evaluate them at some reasonable as a function of temperature, they just smoothly one, they, they always both contribute at the same order and they smoothly sort of transition from one to the other. And 
you may formally get some kind of transition at temperatures of order C, but I don't think that really counts. Hmm. Sorry, Tom, you talked about the graviton, you know, the stress tensor that you you could construct as a composite out of these uh, these U1 the U1 fields. Um, uh, so are you thinking of the dual to that as a graviton? Or are you thinking of it as a two particles? I mean, is there a sense in which you want to think of that as a bulk graviton and that's the reason you have to sum over topologies? Well, I would like to think about it that way, but I don't have anything very concrete to, to say in that direction. It's it's not a separate state. I mean, the, the, the bulk graviton is really, it's a composite. It's a two particle state. Um, whether that gives me an excuse to sum over topologies is not obvious at all. My vague feeling is that maybe there's a way of rephrasing the bulk theory in a way that um, that looks more like gravity. There, there was a proposal for the, along these lines by um, um, in a paper a couple weeks ago that I cited here by Perez and Troncoso. Um, roughly, I want to say that this U1 to the C theory at large C um, has a, that maybe one can sort of do a, do a, a large N analysis of that, of that theory and write down a effective composite field the same way we would say for the ON model where we factor out the N, uh, but I don't know if that's possible. So, uh, so actually this uh, reminds, I mean, the symmetric orbifold CFT is in some sense like a torus, uh, symmetric orbifold of T4. It's N copies of the torus. The only additional thing you're doing is you're orbifolding by the symmetric group. Uh, um, and there the stress tensor is indeed something like what you have on this slide here. It is. Uh, it's exactly the same. It's built from the U1 currents of the torus, uh, and it's a sum over all the n copies. Uh, um, so, so that per se, I think I don't think it is uh, something very uh, uh, unusual. But, uh, uh, but I was just wondering where I mean the extra ingredient in the symmetric orbifold, which is very important for this non-abelian constraint, is this. Uh, is this orbifolding uh, by the symmetric group? Is it possible? I mean, it seems like it it should be. You you might be able to commute it through some of these operations uh, um, uh, of taking the average in some ways, um, uh, taking uh, uh, an orbifold by the symmetric group. Mm. Yeah, that would be very very interesting. It might be it, that might be. That might be doable. Um, there's a paper by Greg Moore, which um, studies the metric on the moduli spice, space of symmetric orbifolds. And um, there's a lot of similarities in his calculation and our calculation, but I um, don't know exactly how to put them together. Hmm. Because there you would end up at least with, okay, not maybe with pure gravity but uh, uh, or this thing, but at least uh, there's a genuine bulk string theory. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, I guess the, the you could in principle look at the untwisted, I mean, the uh, the uh, the twisted sectors, I guess, give you all the uh, all those low lying primaries, which uh, w which are the things you didn't want in some ways here. But uh, um, so that's what I think the orbifold introduces that complication for you. Uh, but you could ask the question. I, I don't know whether it makes sense, but whether the averaged 
symmetric orbifold theory is in some sense a kind of a meaningful quantity in the bulk, um, even if not. Yeah, maybe. Um, it's, even, it's quite possible, yeah. I think as it stands right now, this duality is a is is more on a footing like the SYK ADS2 duality where you where if you really want to include all the fields, if you really want to include all the all the SYK fermions, you would have to include all these fields in the bulk. In fact, I I in a previous talk someone pointed out that um, these theories have a free fermion in moduli space somewhere. And um, it might be that you can really think of this as a higher dimensional SYK, because if we, if we sit at the free fermion point and add a random four Fermi interaction, like we would in the SYK model, um, that sounds pretty similar to actually studying random Lorain CFTs. Uh, with, if, you view, if you view the free fermion point as sort of the starting point. Uh, Tom, can I ask a question? Actually, it's a little bit historical. What was the reason the mathematicians were looking at uh, doing this averaging? I mean, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't, I don't think I understand it very well. I mean, Siegel was interested in um, quadratic forms. He was studying quadratic forms and trying to. I think he was interested in counting integer solutions of um, Diophantine equations. And um, exactly how this topic connects to that, I don't have a great sense. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Uh, I mean, it's uh, something I don't know, but uh, you may clarify. In point number two, you say that uh, you know, ordinary 3D gravity is related to SL2 R plus SL2 R Q and Simons, but not identical. I mean, uh, what what is different? What is missing in SL2 R cross SL2 R John Simons theory? Yeah, so one one difference is the is the sum over topologies. So in, in SL2R Chern Simons theory, we fix the topology first. Yes. Um, and then then define the Hilbert space on that topology. So once you do the sum over topologies, you have a di very different uh, partition function, spectrum, Hilbert space, etc. That's one difference. I think that even perturbatively, if you Think about um, the gauge orbits. There's a there's a difference, which comes from the fact that in SL2 Chern Simons theory, there's no analog of of restricting to non-degenerate metrics. In the gravity side, we don't we don't allow degenerate metrics, but in the SL2 R Chern Simons yes. theory, we do, and um, so that that gives a difference even without going to higher topology. I see. Thanks. And by the way, in, in the standard way of doing JT gravity in two dimensions, um, it's, it's, it's done in a way that's a bit more like Chern Simons theory. And I think we don't really restrict to non degenerate metrics in the way that, that theory is usually studied. Yes. Uh, sorry, could I ask what is probably a very, very stupid question? Um, I'm trying to understand why the first primary is so heavy. <laughs> Uh, if you just took a bunch of self-dual circles, that would not be the case. Um, 
So could you give me just some rough intuition for why typical primary is first primary is ready? Um, it's I, I don't I don't know if I have a satisfying answer to this. I'll say one thing which is it's similar to the reason that that sphere packings in high dimensions are, are mostly empty. The, the fact that it's very hard to make a dense sphere packing in high, in high dimensions. Um, I don't think I have a, I don't think I have an intuitive answer. I agree that if, I agree if you, if you sit it, if you sit at the, at your first, your first guess at an arranged CFT uh, will will be a very special one, which which does not satisfy this bound. Uh, but the claim is that most of the moduli space is elsewhere. Uh, right. So maybe I could ask uh, for for any given C, can you construct one example that does have a very high? Yeah, this is <laughs> the answer is no. Um, and this is a this is confusing because um, after all, most most lattices, most Narain lattices have this property. But why can't, then why can't we construct one? Um, the answer is that we can construct one with very high probability by just using a random number generator to to generate a Narain lattice. But the problem of computing the shortest vector, so if I if I run that random number generator now, the problem of computing the shortest vector to check it. Is uh, is a exponentially difficult computational problem. Um, so even like on a computer, we cannot generate Narain lattices, which we're sure in at large a large dimension, we can generate them, but we're not sure that they're sparse. Uh, and I think there is no ex there's also no explicit construction that gets anywhere close to uh, to this gap. Thank you. There's a, it's, the situation with sphere packings is similar in that um, you can prove that the density can be at least a certain, a certain number, but you can't actually construct any sphere packings that, that obtain it. And that is not a contradiction. I mean, I mean if it turns out that there is no such uh, uh, conformal field theory, that you can construct, it is not a contradiction. I mean, you do you expect uh, to have some particular theory? Uh, yeah, it's, it's not that they don't exist. Theory? Yeah, it's oh, it's oh, not I that see. they don't exist. You can prove that they exist. They definitely oh, exist. I see. I see. It's, just, it's 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 a computational problem of of finding one okay. and then I checking see. that it's true. I see. Okay. I see. It's not obvious, actually. I mean, how such a proof would go either, actually, to me at least. I mean, uh, you mean the proof that they exist? Yes. Yeah. Well, Siegel's proof is already a proof that they exist because if you calc, if it, I mean, there certainly has to be theories that whose whose gap is as big as the average, and and we have the answer for the average. So that proves that they exist. Here were here the 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 argument that was used to derive this was not a modular bootstrap. It was not a bootstrap type argument where you carve out the, the space of theories like we orf, often talk about in Virasoro. This was a constructive proof in that we started with actual Narain CFTs and we just did the average. So we know that they exist. Unlike the case of Virasoro, uh, where we have all these bounds on delta one, but we we don't really know whether you can find any theories that are anywhere close to that. Nice. Okay. Thanks.
Hi, Tom. Hey, it's Raghu. I have a question. Um, is there a more general class of three manifolds over which the sum might be tractable? Like, so we've discussed this sum over handle bodies, and that's definitely not all the three manifolds, but is there, do you know of any physical situation where a sum comes up that is bigger than this, but maybe smaller than, you know, all the three manifolds? Yeah, I think that there's an example of this in this recent paper of Maxfield and Teriyachi. So I, uh -huh. I, haven't, I haven't studied this in much detail yet, so I, I can't say exactly what they did. But I think what they've, I think roughly um, what they've done is they've looked at a um, near extremal limit where they are able to find other topologies and include them. And what they found is that in that limit, it does seem to fix the non-unitary issue in the maloney witten partition function to, by including these other contributions. I see. That's the only so example in, that I know of. I see. So in his talk at Strings, I guess he was talking about the ciphered manifolds, and those are not in this handle body class, I guess. Um, Okay. I think I, th that was my understanding, but I'm not, I'm, okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, do we have uh, any more questions for Tom? Uh, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Tom again uh, for this uh, nice talk. Uh, and uh, 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 yeah, th thanks, Tom, again. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Thanks. That was a great talk. Yeah, thank you. Tom. That was very nice. Thanks. Yeah.